Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? What subject uh, is of concern to you? You might be advised again that on this program we are finally interested in what the Bible has to say about any subject that is brought up for discussion. If at all possible, we want to relate the question to the Bible. And that is for a very, very good reason. The Bible is the Word of God. It is God's book to mankind. It is God's law book that sets forth all the rules and precepts and commandments by which we are to live in order to please God. And we have to have a tremendous concern about pleasing God because we have to answer to God someday. We were created in the image of God and therefore we're accountable to God as to how we have lived out our life. And therefore we should be intensely interested in what the Bible has to say. At the same time, as we're trying to discover what God would have for us, we'll also be discovering the wisdom of God. On this program, for example, we don't trust my wisdom. My, that wouldn't be worth anything. We have to trust the wisdom of God. It is infinite. It is uh, from Almighty God Himself. And so we trust that as you... Uh, as you uh, listen to this program, you will be encouraged to get more and more into the Word of God. As a matter of fact, you know, we have a, a, a question here that has come from a listener in Cuba. Cuba is, uh, uh, you know, in English we call that Cuba, and it is uh, a close enough to the United States so that we can bombard it with family radio. We have a a 50 kilowatt transmitter dedicated to just broadcasting shortwave into Cuba. And so a great many people in the land of Cuba listen and are very well acquainted with family radio. Well, here comes the question. Can you help me? My question is, how can my family and I be ready for the coming of the Lord. I am worried as my family has not heard the Word of God. Well, that question, of course, is a, should be faced and thought about by every human because Christ is coming again. Actually, we don't have to wait until the last day before this becomes reality. Bear in mind, you hear me say this again and again, and it's altogether true, that every week approximately one million people die. And when we die, and a great many people die very unexpectedly, that insofar as the one who has died is the end of the world. If they died unsaved, the next thing they will know is that they are standing at the judgment throne of God to answer for their sins. Of course, they'll be found guilty, and they'll be cast into hell forevermore. So, uh, this is an imperative question. Am I ready to meet God right now? And uh, the question is, uh, how do we find out about God? What is, what is the solution? Well, we read in the Bible that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And what is the Word of God? That is the Bible. Now here is a uh, person who is deeply concerned about his family. They have not heard the Word of God. What he should do is try to get a, uh, to them a Bible. A, this is in the Spanish a language, of course, that's the language of Cuba, and uh, they should begin to read it and read it and read it. Fact is, anyone in the whole wide world cannot hurt himself, and it is always the wisest possible thing to do to read the Bible, to read it earnestly, carefully, 
uh, slowly uh, and uh, meditate on what is read. Praying all the time, Oh, Lord, help me to have some understanding. Oh, Lord, help me to be obedient. I don't know whether I'm ever going to become saved or not because nobody can know that ahead of time. Nobody knows who are the elect of God. But, oh, Lord, uh, 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 all I know is, is that I want to know more and more about the kingdom of God. I want to know more and more about this salvation plan that I hear about from the Bible. I want to know more and more about God himself. I want to know more and more about my sins. And I know the answers are in the Bible. And, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, bless me now as I read, as I read, as I read the Bible. And we know that God is merciful. Oh, my God is merciful. And so I... In his mercy, maybe God will save me. I'm not worthy. I know. That's one thing we have to begin to admit as we read the Bible and see uh, how terrible our sins are and how much we deserve damnation for our sins. We must conclude uh, I'm not entitled to this any kind of help from God. I'm not entitled to any mercy I'm not entitled to the grace of God. I don't deserve any of this. I know I deserve hell. And yet, and yet, oh Lord, you are a merciful God. Have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. And that's pleasing to God that we come pleading to him. Uh, So this is the answer to our question from Cuba. Uh, Your family has not heard the word of God, get into their possession a Bible so that they can begin to read it. And I don't care what country anyone is in or how rich or how poor or how well-educated or uneducated, if at all possible, come under the hearing of the word of God. The Bible is God speaking. You're listening to the voice of Almighty God. And you can't listen to anything more important than that. And that's one of the reasons we have Family Radio, where we can band together, we can pool our resources, we can, we can answer the question that, or the command that God gives us to go into all the world by making our funds available, that the gospel can go forth. Isn't it wonderful that we can join in a ministry like that, not only to reach Cuba, but also to reach all the most of the major continents of the world with an intense offering of the gospel so that many, many, potentially millions and even billions of people are under the hearing of the Word of God. My, what an opportunity. What an opportunity God gives us to join together in this kind of a venture. Well, thank you, Cuba, for that good question, and may God give you wisdom in this matter. And now shall we go to our first caller from our telephone lines. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Father Held? Yes. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could uh, explain Luke 16 for me about the uh, unjust steward. Yes, that again is emphasizing the very thing we were talking about. The people of the world, uh, they make preparation as best they can for the future. They, uh, they uh, uh, have uh, money salted away. They uh, have... Uh, uh, plans so that when they get aged uh, and they don't aren't working anymore, that they'll be able to continue to live comfortably. Uh, and the unsaved are very, very concerned about this. In this case, in Luke 16, God even uses the illustration of a man who is um, acting like the unsaved. He he cuts corners. He uh, defrauds the the company that he's with. Uh, still with by by offering uh, customers a reduced rate 
uh, uh, so that when he gets fired from his job, uh, he can run to them and expect favors from them. Because after all, didn't I do favors for you? And so the upshot of it all is, is that God said, uh, commended this unjust steward, and he commends the people of the world, therefore, in that sense, uh, uh, by saying that uh, they have done wisely. That is wisely within the framework of sin. It's not wisely in the framework of having a right relationship with God, but it's wisely in connection with with uh, facing the reality of life as they see it. For the children of, he goes on, for the children of this world are in their generation, and that generation is the generation of evil. Uh, they are wiser than the children of light. Now, what is God's expectation for the true believer? They are the children of light. They also have to make provision for the future. But it's a very, very curious way to do that. Uh, God says in verse 9, uh, And I say unto you, he's now talking to those of us who claim to be believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, Make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. That is, by your money. Uh, that God has assigned to you, He has loaned to you, because after all, we don't own our money or our wherewithal, anything that we have. It's only God's mercy that He puts it into our stewardship, under our care. We are now to utilize it uh, in a way that is pleasing to God. And He is telling us here that we are to make friends with that money, and these are very special friends. He says that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitation. That means use your money so that people can become, uh, can hear the gospel, because through the hearing of the gospel, God saves people. And so there will be those who uh, have become saved if you have judicially used your money to uh, to make possible the sending forth of the gospel there will be those in heaven even before you get there who will greet you you don't know who they are you don't know uh, what Im what impact uh, the money that you spent has made in this whole business but nevertheless there will be those there who uh, who will uh, in a print in a sense greet you because they heard the gospel and, there, and through the gospel, God saved them. And the reason they were able to hear the gospel is because you used your money that God had entrusted to into your care to send the gospel out into the world. That's really what this passage is talking about. And thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes, good evening. Uh, how are you? I, I'd like to uh, ask about the latter rain and, and what the scriptures are that says that there is a latter rain. Well, we read, for example, we, our caller is asking about the latter rain. We, we read in, um, in um, oh... In the book of James, for example, we read in verse 7, chapter 5, verse 7, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and the latter rain. Now, the fact is that uh, that uh, uh, basically there can be two crops, if you will. They're in the springtime, we get the early rains, and, uh, and uh, there is the initial harvest, the harvest that, that identifies with Pentecost, the beginning of the sending forth of the gospel throughout the New Testament era. Uh, that would, could be called the Pentecostal harvest. But then, right near the end, before Christ comes again, it's, uh, spiritually it's near the end of the year, 
there is the final harvest that comes in, and that requires the latter rain. The rains that fell early in the spring and in summer, they will not be sufficient to produce crops uh, in the fall, uh, just before the end of the year. So there has to be the latter rain, and that comes in uh, right before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we are living at that time, right near the end. We're living at the time of the latter rain. And it is, uh, uh, it is uh, when we study the Bible and examine what it is, and remember the rain that is being talked about here is the gospel. We, it identifies with Deuteronomy 32, verse 2. My doctrine, that is, my teaching, shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. And it is, in other words, it is the gospel that comes from heaven and produces the fruit of people becoming saved. And, uh, and uh, until the latter rain comes and the final harvest comes in, Christ will not return. And that is what we are experiencing right now. We have other passages to show that this latter rain would begin after the early rain had done its work and brought in its harvest. In Revelation 7, God talks about 144,000 who have to be sealed before certain ugly things will happen. But then it's after certain ugly things happen that after that comes the latter rain, and that's where we are now in history, as God is sending the gospel out through individuals, that is the latter rain, sending out the gospel through individuals, not by the churches and congregations which had been used of God to send forth the to gather in the Pentecostal fruit. And thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, may I call you by your first name? Yes, go ahead. Hi, Harold. My name is Mark. I have numerous questions. I'll try to keep the simple ones first. The first one is pertaining to, are there any biblical laws governing the way a man and a woman wear their hair? The way a man and a woman uh, it, in the marriage relationship uh, have intimacy, is that your question? No, the way a man and a woman wears their hair. Oh, the way they wear their hair. Yes, and it, well, no. No, there, there are not. In 1 Corinthians 11, God talks about a woman uh, that, they, that her hair is her pride, uh, and God has given different hair than a woman, and, it, but it, and that the woman's hair is a sign that she is uh, under the authority of her husband. There is a chain of command, and if she refuses that authority, then she should be shaven. And by the same token, God says a man is not to wear his hair long, mimicking a woman, because that is uh, he has taken on the sign that the woman has. And so that's the only admonition, uh, the, the matter of... Uh, of uh, a man not wearing his hair long. Now, in the Old Testament, it talks about cutting, uh, uh, cutting uh, the hair in a. Uh, but it, it's in the context of of uh, idol worship, and it's not it's not any kind of a rule that we would be interested or be necessarily have to follow in any sense today. So, is it safe for me to say it's just a personal preference? Well, it's a totally a personal preference, except that you don't want to wear your hair long like a woman. That's not preference. That's God's command. So for a man, it's more of a law for a man than it is for a woman. Yeah, for example, you can uh, many men shave off their hair, mm -hmm. and they have a bald head, and that's not, a, that's not uh, wrong at all to do. Okay. Some wear their hair very short, and a crew cut of some kind, and some want to have it a little longer. Uh, uh, that is all personal preference. What biblical verse is that pertaining to a man? 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11. Let me get the verse for you. In, uh, in 1 
Corinthians 11, verse, verse um, 14. If a woman have long hair, it is a shame unto him. Okay, then my next question will probably be very quick is, what is, law, what is God's law in governing multiple piercings of the body? The Bible doesn't again underscore that, but our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit if we're a child of God, and, mm -hmm. and why would we want to mutilate our body? That's why, why would we uh, uh, do any of these kinds of things to our body? That doesn't make any sense. I agree, and another question is, can you explain to me what... 10% uh, if I'm pronouncing the word right 10% tilt given to God well you see in the Old Testament God set up the principle of tithing a tithe was 10% and that represented the whole it was a token uh, to indicate really everything that we are belongs to you and we're giving the 10%. Now, that's a good rule for the New Testament believer to follow. Mm -hmm. As a minimum, he ought to give at least, make available at least 10% of his income. For the, for, and, and a big task of the believer is to send the gospel out into the world. And, and uh, so we want to try to spend that 10% as wisely and as efficiently as possible to to reach as many people as possible with the true gospel. Okay, one more, and I could take this off on the air, off the phone, if you if it's okay with you. This next one might be a little bit in depth. If you'd like to cover it, would be how does uh, a believing Christian handle or deal with people who say they are believers, but finally find out months and months later that the other person isn't a believer? a true believer you follow am I explaining this properly well I understand entirely but you see we must never be standing in judgment of others there are many many people who call themselves believers who probably are not true believers nobody can look at their heart to see if they've really been given a brand new resurrected soul in some cases they claim to be believers and it's very evident by their lifestyle that they probably are not true believers, but we don't we don't have to handle that matter. That's not my business. My business is to look into the mirror and and ask myself, Am I a true believer? Have I truly been born from above? Am I a new creature in Christ? Is that really evident in my life by the fact that? I have a real desire to do the will of God, and I have a tremendous love for the Word of God, and I'm ready to be obedient to anything that I find uh, is a command to me as a as a child of God. Uh, the the focal point of our who we have to handle is me, 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 myself, and I, not other people. And thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Oh, Mr. Camping, I can't believe I'm on. Um, I have a uh, question about uh, Micah, chapter 7, verse 5. Uh, Mic Micah, seven. chapter 7, verse 5. Let's look at that a moment. Okay. Micah, that's in the Old Testament. Yeah. And in chapter 7 verse 5 we read trust ye not in a friend put ye not confidence in a guide keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom now what is your question uh, well also um, um, verse 6 but I wanted to know if that related to uh, Amos 5 verse 13 well, let's, let me read verse 6. Okay. For the son dishonoreth the father, the daughter rises up against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. Now, this is, uh, this is uh, looking very, very... Um, hmm, how do I want to put it? It's, uh, it? it's indicating, ultimately, we have no trust in 
our fellow human. They're going to let us down. Uh, it is, uh, we, we, uh, uh, this is because we all have feet of clay. We're going to be disappointed uh, from time to time. We thought that someone had made a promise to us and they didn't come through. Uh, they made a commitment to us and, and it didn't develop the way they had made the commitment. And so we're going to be disappointed. The only friend, the only guide that we are to look to who will never, never let us down is God himself. He is the friend that sticketh closer than a brother. He is He is not the friend that is uh, in view here. The friend that is in view here is just a human friend. But we know God is not in view because God is absolutely uh, faithful to every commitment and promise he makes, whether it's a commitment to bring uh, good things or it's a commitment that under certain situations he'll bring bad things you can depend upon it that if God has said he will do it he will do it uh, Amos chapter 5 verse 13 does that relate no, in 513 we read in uh, in Verse 12, For I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins. They afflict the just. They take a bribe. They turn aside the poor and the gate from their right. Therefore the prudent shall keep silence in that time, for it is an evil time. Now here God is particularly talking about our time, the time of great tribulation when in the churches and congregations, and that is the setting of this, is uh, when when uh, 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 Christ is not ruling there anymore, and and uh, there's no there really we shouldn't trust anything there. The only thing we should trust is the Bible. If there's ever a time that we must trust only the Bible, it's now. Although that's true at any time. Never, we never trust. I never want anyone to trust me. I, I, I want people only to trust the Bible because that is the Word of God, and He is absolutely faithful to His commitments. We're continuing with the Open Forum, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Before, and I'm going to go to this very clearly so everyone in the audience can get an understanding. You stated before that our salvation is based upon nothing we do. We can't contribute in any way to our salvation, correct? Yes. So, my point is this. Now, you said before that people should leave their churches because they want to be as obedient to the Word of God as possible. But if your doctrine of predestination or preordainment is true, then their salvation is decided before anybody was on this earth already. And if they leave the church or not, ultimately, bottom line, their obedience isn't going to contribute or take away or from their salvation. So why should anyone leave the church or do anything if our salvation has already been decided by God? And I don't think I know more than God, but I'm just saying that. Why well, should anybody do anything if their salvation is already decided? And well, we let me ask contribute. you this question. I'm an alcoholic, let's say. Okay. And if, uh, if uh, my salvation was already decided before the foundation of the earth, or I've been chosen of God, then why should I worry about whether I quit drinking or not? After mm -hmm. all, after all, if God's going to save me, He'll save me. I don't. I don't have to worry about it. That that uh, that I'm an alcoholic. If He saves me, He'll give me an intense desire to turn away from my drink. And if He doesn't save me, I might as well continue to enjoy my alcohol. I mean, uh, that that you are simply. Uh, suggesting that we take a fatalistic attitude. We, we just don't worry about those things. But that isn't the way God comes with the gospel. God, God comes with the gospel that we are to obey Him. And, we, and when we are, truly have become believers, we have a want to to obey Him. 
if someone just says, well, if I'm elect of God, then whether I leave or not, I'm safe and secure, and he's disobeying God, he's like the alcoholic who is saying, well, I don't... I'm uh, I'm uh, safe and uh, I I don't have to worry about that because if I'm elect elective God God will save me. The nature of the true believer is that he has a want to to obey, and if he discovers that such a major teaching is uh, is uh, is is talked about in the scriptures, he's going to get really nervous. Uh, because he 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 knows that he wants to do God's will, and uh, and uh, uh, even though it means taking uh, an action that that into that emotionally he doesn't care for at all. Well, on that point, what you just said, I mean, you could, you said that the that the evidence of, the, of of being saved is that we have an intense desire to be obedient to God. But if everyone's salvation is already decided before they were on this planet, take a six-month-old baby. There's going to be no evidence in that baby's life as to whether he's saved or not because he doesn't know how to talk, walk, or write, or do anything. But he's still saved or he cannot be saved. So you, the, the evidence of salvation doesn't have to be there in our lives because a six-month-old baby, there's not going to be evidence of salvation in his but life. That, but, but, he can be saved. but he, we don't rewrite the rules of the Bible. The Bible says there is evidence of salvation. Where? There is evidence. Where? We read in First John chapter uh, uh, three, verse two, or, or chapter two, verse three, rather, where God says, "If we say we know Him, we will keep His commandments, and if we don't keep His commandments, we're a liar, and the truth is not in us." There is evidence. Now you can't see the evidence in a six-month-old baby, of course. But but uh, those who are uh, are answering the or facing the issue of whether to leave churches or not, they're not six old months old babies. These are mature individuals who who uh, are are hearing from the Word of God, and and uh, and uh, they they have to they have to answer to God for what God is commanding. One more question. Um, I like to call I like to call your whole understanding about leaving the church is like I like to call it uh, mystery commandments because in the Bible when God says Thou shalt not steal, Thou shalt not kill, Thou shalt not bear false witness, these things are crystal clear. Now in Revelation 18 when it says Come out of my people Babylon, I've been studying for years. There are people who say that mystery Babylon is America, mystery Babylon is the church. There's, these, these are mystery commandments which are simply the interpretations of a man. There's nowhere clear in the Bible. I, I I just think it's fascinating how people are, are just listening to you from your interpretation. It's, it's a mystery commandment. This is an interpretation well, let's, you have. That's all uh, excuse me. Let's see how mysterious it is. Uh, we could turn to Jeremiah chapter 6, and I can show that Jeremiah is definitely talking about today because it's talking about the latter rain. But Jeremiah 6, the whole chapter, is dealing with Jerusalem which is also called Zion. Zion and Jerusalem are synonyms. And it starts right out, O ye children of Benjamin, gather yourselves to flee out of the midst of Jerusalem. And uh, then it goes on and it indicates God's wrath on Jerusalem. He says in verse 22 of Jeremiah 6, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, a people cometh from the north country, and a great nation shall be raised from the sides of the earth. They shall lay hold on bow and spear. They are cruel and have no mercy. Their voice roareth like the sea, and they ride upon horses, set in array as men for war against thee, O daughter of Zion. In other words, this is talking about God's wrath coming on the daughter of Zion. And the and one more verse, we have heard the fame thereof, our hands wax feeble, anguish hath taken hold of us, and pain as of a woman in travail. Just as a woman uh, is going to bear a child, and, and she knows it's going to come, and once the child begins to be born, she can't stop it. She doesn't know the precise moment, but she can't stop it, and so judgment is, has come like a woman in travail against the daughter of Zion. Now, turn to Jeremiah 50. Hold your finger in Jeremiah 6. 
turn to Jeremiah 50. And the whole chapter is talking about Babylon. Babylon. And I'm going to read verse 41. Behold, a people shall come from the north, and a great nation, and many kings shall be raised up from the coasts of the earth. Almost identical to verse 22 of Jeremiah 6. And then it says, the next verse is even more identical. They shall hold the bow and lance. They are cruel and will not show mercy. <clears throat> Their voice shall roar like the sea, and they shall ride upon horses, everyone put in array like a man to the battle. Virtually identically, identical phrases to verse 23 of Jeremiah 6. And this is a very complex verse that God has designed to show something very, very uh, important. Because then the end of the verse says, uh, like a man in the battle against thee, O daughter of Babylon. Now, in verse, in Jeremiah 6, he said against thee, O daughter of Zion, that is of Jerusalem. And here he says, no, it's O daughter of Babylon. And God very carefully has put these two passages in the Bible. So when we set them alongside of each other, they're virtually identical. And they're not just slightly, uh, uh, they're not just simple verses. They're very complex verses with many points in them. And they're virtually identical with one major difference. Major difference. One says against the daughter of Zion the other against the daughter of Babylon. And so God is teaching us beyond any question that Zion has become Babylon. And this, it, uh, if we were reading this ten years ago or five years ago, we wouldn't understand. We'd wonder, why, what is God teaching here? What's he saying here? But because we have so much other information that also emphasizes that Jerusalem has become Babylon, we immediately say, well, of course, that's what God is teaching, that Zion or Jerusalem has become Babylon, because Satan now rules there, and he is the king of Babylon. And that's why he says in Revelation chapter 18, verse 4, Come out of her, my people, because uh, because uh, uh, otherwise you're going to be caught in the plagues. That's why he says in verse 6 of Jeremiah 51, Flee out of the midst of Babylon and deliver every man his soul and be not cut off in her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. Now, we can close our eyes to this, and we can rationalize, and we can do a whole lot of things. But I'll tell you, when you find these two passages virtually identical, and yet they're very complex statements, and one ends up with against the daughter of Zion, or Jerusalem, and the other against Babylon, the daughter of Babylon, then you know that God has has uh, taught us something very important that we better listen to. Just end it with this. You're, you're, you're obviously just a man, and I read the scripture. The Holy Spirit teaches me, not you. And I'll just say that, but this is the point. In Galatians 5.22, it says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, yeah, gentleness. But excuse me, excuse me. You read the scriptures, fine. I'm, I read the scriptures. I read the scriptures. I, what I've been just telling you is not my idea. I read the scriptures. So please read Jeremiah 6. Please read Jeremiah 50. They are the scriptures. They are the Bible. And they're just as important as Galatians or, or Ephesians or the Gospel of John or anything else. This is the Word of God. And that's what's the hard thing for all of us, is that when the Word of God calls for action, we don't like it. And then we begin to rationalize, and we begin to, uh, to uh, we don't get really interested. But 
you must read Jeremiah, and particularly these two chapters. And and you can't. The, the, this is the word of God. This is the word of God. God has said this, not me. God has said this. The daughter of Zion equals the daughter of Babylon. Whether we like it or not is immaterial. That is what God has said. Brother Camping. If, okay, so you just said that that's the word of God. I could pull uh, Luke 14:33, where Christ said, if a man forsakes not all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. And I could beat the drum saying, anybody who doesn't forsake all, it's not what I'm saying. It's what the word of God says. Brother Camping, the Bible says a lot of things. There's many false prophets who are going out into the world which are going to deceive the elect. And I just think people should be wary of, of, of false prophets. Not saying that you're one, but I'm just saying there's many of them going out and they're going to deceive people with the Bible. Well, excuse me you're correct but that's why we read the Bible that's why we read the Bible that's why I'm not telling you to trust me I'm saying listen to the Bible a false prophet is going to come along and say look I, I, I have found this and I have found that and, and he's not going to read the whole Bible but the fact is this idea that Jerusalem has become Babylon is displayed all through the Bible. All through the Bible. And here we have two passages that, that uh, make it conclusive. Conclusive. The daughter of Zion equals the daughter of Babylon. And the context clearly shows that it's speaking of the same time, namely the, uh, the time we're in which we are living, the time of great tribulation. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Um, hi, Brother Camping. Yes. I have a question. How are we to honor... Um, God says, honor thy mother and thy father. Yes. And how are we to do that when our parents provoke us um, to be angry? Well, first of all, to honor them means that we have a high regard for them. And this is not just something we wear on our sleeves, so to speak. It's just kind of a hypocritical high regard in our soul. We, re we look at our parents and recognize we are the, ch the child of my parents. They, uh, uh, I came from them, and I have a high regard for them. Now, I don't always appreciate them the way I should. I don't always agree with them the way uh, in, some, in many things, and they're not always nice. They, they a lot of times uh, are, are, are saying things that make me angry, but the fact is, I have a high regard for them, I, and I love them with a passion. They are my parents. And when I become angry, I have to ask myself, why am I becoming angry? What excuse do any of us have for becoming angry at any time? Most of the time, when we become angry, it's because we feel threatened, or we uh, can't get our way about something, or we uh, have been reviled in some way, but, uh, but uh, the same principle holds when anybody reviles us or when they uh, threaten us or whatever. We don't take the bait. We don't revile in return. We, we remember we only answer to God. But this is my parents. And I love them, and, uh, and uh, I'm sorry that they feel this way, and I, I, I wish they didn't, but I, but, uh, and, and maybe they're going to uh, make some, some terrible statements about me, but so be it, so be it. I love them. I, they are my parents, and I'm going to try to show my love to them, and maybe it's time for me to send them a, a bouquet of flowers. I haven't done that in a long time. Uh, maybe it's time for me to uh, bring over a uh, uh, something I have baked to that I haven't uh, done for them for a long time. In other words, this is a two-way street. I understand what you're saying. Maybe I didn't use the right word. Um, I, I used the word angry. Um, 
When... Turn your radio off, please. Yeah. Okay. Turn the radio off, Donald. Okay. Um, I used the wrong word, angry. Um, uh, my parent hasn't, as far as I feel, my parent hasn't really been a parent. I read the Bible, and um, they haven't really, um, because of, of, uh, of their history, they haven't been a parent. They yes. haven't. But you see, excuse me, let me interrupt here just a moment, because I understand the line, uh, direction you're going with this. And there's a fundamental principle. We don't love others because they love us. We love others because we are commanded to love them. Now, they are your parents. You have a double reason to love them. First of all, you should love we should love all of our fellow men, but if they're our parents or they're our own family, we have a particular, a particular uh, 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 concern that we love them. And we don't love them because they have been good parents. Maybe your parents have abused you. Maybe they have uh, uh, misused you in one way or another. And you're thoroughly, you could be thoroughly disgusted with it. But the fact is, they are your parents. And so you, uh, and remember earlier on, I talked about a mental attitude in your mind, in the very essence of your being. There has to be a respect for them and an honor for them simply because they are your parents. And if that exists, then, then you will not be struggling as you are right now. Uh, but if, on the other hand, in your very essence of your being, you you uh, are, are uh, uh, you don't regard them at all uh, with any honor, you're you're sorry that they that you had to come from their uh, them as parents. You wish that you did They weren't even your parents. Well, then you're going to have an impossible job trying to show your love to them. It has to begin with your state of mind. Uh, not with what they have done, not what they are doing, but it is your frame of mind that has to be in line with God's desire for you. And then you'll truly begin to honor your parents. And so what you want to do is begin to break down before God, Oh God, have mercy on me and give me that kind of love for my parents and start reading the Bible more and more so that you begin more and more to have the mentality of what a true child of God ought to have. Thank you so much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. Yes. I have a couple questions about John 1, verse 33. Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 33. Let's look at that. John 1, verse 33. And I knew, uh, this is John, uh, the, the Baptist speaking, who was the cousin of Jesus. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. Now, what is your question? Uh, one of two, if I may. Uh, first one is, uh, you've taught that Jesus was baptized of John to fulfill a... Uh, the Old Testament ceremonial cleansing before entering into the priestly ministry. Yes. What was the uh, purpose of all the other baptisms of John, not to Jesus? Oh well, they were uh, they were uh, emphasizing you have to have your sins washed away. Uh, in the Old Testament, there were various uh, water ablutions uh, that were were signifying sins have to be washed away. There were 
uh, burn offerings, blood sacrifices, the same thing, signifying your sins have to be washed away. And so John the Baptist is at the Jordan River baptizing people, uh, uh, giving a, a, a uh, picture, a portrait of the fact just as water washes this filth from your flesh, so you have to be washed with the Holy Spirit. That is, you have to have your sins washed away. And uh, now is the time. The kingdom of God is at hand. The one has come. Uh, the Christ has come, who is the one who makes it possible that our sins can be washed away. Um, this is another question. I wanted to ask one more after it, but uh, does that mean that this was a New Testament uh, baptism, uh, very similar to that, at least? Uh, actually, John's baptism was Old Testament baptism. It was still part of the Old Testament water ablutions. It, uh, uh, later on, uh, God, uh, uh, we read about Crispus and his family being baptized, and uh, 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 we read of the, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch being baptized. That distinctly was New Testament baptism, water baptism. But this... This is really part of Old Testament uh, uh, cleansing, signifying that your sins have to be washed away. Uh, my last question, sir, uh, is um, first, we don't read that uh, in an earlier part of the New Testament that God had told John what to do, but here we do. He said, he that sent me said... Um, he spoke of how the Spirit would descend on him uh, and uh, like a dove. But the, I wanted to relate that back to the introduction to, to your Mission Springs Conference where you said that uh, Genesis 3, verse 3, where Eve said that God had said something. That was the first lie. Now, uh, where does it... I mean, does it have to say that God had said something to her that for to her to have um, been told it? Uh, thank you. I'll hang up and take my answer. Well, the, the fact is, the Bible does say that God told Adam uh, that you are to uh, take take care of the garden, but uh, and you can eat of all the fruit, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you cannot eat. And uh, as he's talking to Adam, he's talking to Eve because they are one flesh. And so, and then she admitted, yea, God has said. And so uh, uh, we don't have to doubt that at all, that God spoke to her. Uh, through, uh, at, at the same time he spoke to Adam, in a real sense he is uh, uh, speaking to her. She was still in the rib of Adam. And afterwards, uh, when Adam... Uh, uh, when uh, when God created or made um, created Eve from the rib of Adam, then you can be confident that Adam would have shared it. So it would still be the with her that this is what God has said. So God has said it to her. Just like today, we can say uh, to someone, uh, the Bible says so and so and so and so. Well, they they haven't heard uh, God physically speak. But because we've told them that the Bible says this, now they have heard that this is what God has said. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Brother Camping, how are you tonight? Very well, thank you. Okay, Brother Camping, please bear with me, because I just I had a thought tonight, and I'm, I'm kind of excited about it, and I want to make sure I get it across clearly, because I really want your input. Um, okay, first I have to ask you one or two questions, and you stop me as soon as I say something that, that's wrong. Um, the kingdom of God that the believers enter into when we become saved, is that called spiritual Jerusalem? It's called a Jerusalem above or the Jerusalem and the, the new Jerusalem. Uh, it... Uh, uh, it uh, the Bible doesn't use the word spiritual Jerusalem, but it is Jerusalem. But it, it's... it is Jerusalem. When we are, when we are saved, we are eternally in the uh, in the eternal Jerusalem, or the 
the Jerusalem, that the Bible speaks of Jerusalem above in Galatians 4. We are eternally there, and we cannot leave that. We cannot come out of that. Okay, so far so good. Okay, so then my question is about um, Matthew, let's see, 27... Verse 52, that you get so many questions about, the graves opened and the bodies of the saint arose and appeared to many. Yes. Now, um, I know your interpretation um, about the holy city, but is that written in stone? And I don't mean that as a pun, but is, is there room for maybe another, uh, just an idea that, that just came to me? Um, if the saints are in Jerusalem above... But I mean, living saints, like, like the believers on earth here, we are in Jerusalem right now, the above Jerusalem. Wouldn't that, couldn't that have been what this is talking about, that we are in the holy city because we're in the kingdom of God? Excuse me, I'll be right back to you right after this message. We have a caller who's asking about Matthew 27, verse 52. And the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now, there is no holy city here on this earth. It is true that when we are saved, we are citizens of the holy city, or of Jerusalem above, but, but uh, we don't know who they are. We don't know who these people are. Only God knows, and it won't be revealed until the last day who are. But on the other hand, in heaven, there are those who are uh, with Christ, and they, uh, they're, uh, they are together as the holy city. So that's the only holy city that could be in view here, uh, and that would be the heavenly holy city. Oh, I see. Okay, because the, the other thing that made me think that is because when Christ rose, he appeared, and I, I'm assuming this, but when he appeared to, to, to people before he ascended into heaven, didn't he appear to saints? I mean, to, to saved people on earth, everybody that saw yes, him? But the saved people on earth are not called the, the holy city. The holy city, so we're not. Uh, no, that, that would not follow. The holy city is in heaven uh, uh, because they that is the whole, uh, c whole gathering of all those who are true believers in heaven. Oh, okay. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. I have a question. Yes. Um, the comment regarding the caller who called before saying, you know, your teaching about the latter rain and your interpretation, he made it sound like you're the only one who thinks this way or believes this way, but if he's still listening, he needs to know that there are many, many, many others who think this way and feel this way. They just don't have a forum to express it or teach it because they don't have a, a radio station to teach it, but they do congregate and they do fellowship together and they do call each other and they do talk to each other. And there's people who have known about these things long before I knew things were going on before I knew there was a family radio or a herald camping. I just never was able to give them proper names or interpretations. So I'm glad God led me to your program. I knew things were amiss long before I found out family radio. So he needs to know there's other people. And his, his main thing that he needs to do is just like you said, read the Bible and ask God for wisdom and God will give it. And then my question is, um, my son is involved in a sport that should he become use it as a career and become famous at, at it, um, it will require him to, he'll be earning a paycheck, and he'll, it'll require him to um, perform his sport on Sundays. And that's just the way it is in America, and it will always be, even if he was to travel to Europe or to another country, it would require him to perform his sport and earn his paycheck <clears throat> on Sundays. And he understands the Ten Commandments, and he understands Sundays, but my husband doesn't, and so um, my son is in a quandary as to what to do, and we've been praying, and I've been praying, but 
I just want to make sure I'm not upsetting my family household, and I am being submit, submissive to my husband and supporting him, but yet I don't want to lead my son astray. He wants to keep the commandments no. as well. Well, you know, the it, it isn't the fourth commandment that's in you, because that that was the seventh day Sabbath that was a was a sign pointing to the fact we're not to work for our salvation in any way but God has given us the Sunday Sabbath that uh, is not part of the ceremonial law it's part of the moral law and actually it's stated in Isaiah 58 the whole chapter of Isaiah 58 like quite a few chapters of Isaiah 58 are really talking about the New Testament age uh, the New Testament time and and in Isaiah 58 God says in uh, verse 13 and he's not talking about the seventh day Sabbath here it's uh, the context won't allow it and and uh, and yet he is talking about a Sabbath and that Sabbath would be the Sunday Sabbath if thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath from doing thy pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight the holy of the Lord honorable and shalt honor him not doing thine own ways nor finding thine own pleasure nor speaking thine own words then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob okay in other words God is saying this is my holy day now he's given us this day for our good uh, we uh, for six days we have to earn a living we seek pleasure we do all the things uh, do our chores around the house and all of these things but every seventh day and it's Sunday God is saying now this is my holy day and it's the day that is to be used for for that which is pleasing to me so reading the Bible and and singing songs of praise and visiting the sick and and uh, sharing the gospel with others, uh, uh, standing out and passing out tracts, and and all of these things are are uh, available uh, activities for uh, for each Sunday. Now we're living in a day where Sunday has been totally desecrated. If we'd go back 50 years. Um, on Sunday, not always for the right reason, but nevertheless the uh, the outcome was the right outcome. Uh, in most communities of America, Sunday, all the shops were closed. Maybe the pharmacy was open a couple of hours, but basically all the shops were closed because this is Sunday. And, uh, and people went to church on Sunday because that was God's time for worship. And uh, and but today uh, the Sunday is totally desecrated, and sports has really become the god. Sports has become a god. That's one of the reasons uh, people pay big sums of money to go to games. They that's their god. That's their religion. That's their uh, that's where they find their enjoyment at. And if we and uh, this is where the trial comes. Here's someone who's got a lot of talent, and uh, and uh, he can make a lot of money in this. Uh, is is what's he going to do? He's being tested. Is he going to follow God, or is he going to follow uh, the world? And uh, he can follow the world and make a lot of money, no question at all about it. Uh, and uh, and uh, then what does he have? What does he have? We have to look a little bit further ahead. Wait until judgment day comes. Those who've had all they want of this world's goods and more than they ever would need, yes, they enjoyed it. They had this world. Oh, my. And wasn't it wonderful time we had? But then what? Eternal damnation eternal damnation you can't have God in the world too the Bible says you can't serve God and mammon you're going to hate the one and, uh, and love the, uh, the other you can't serve both of them and that's the test that your son is in 
uh, he can uh, he uh, he can certainly there's no nothing wrong with playing ball he if he's as skilled uh, he may take a salary that's one tenth of everybody else he says look I'm willing to to uh, be on the team six days of the week but not on Sunday and uh, uh, the question is do I want God's blessing or do I want uh, as much adulation as possible do I want as much money as possible really well, who is my God who is my God is it the God of the Bible or is it the God of the world and so uh, your your son uh, and you as a family and uh, are, are going through a real testing program I I uh, I would if I were in your shoes I'd be praying for wisdom. Oh Lord, oh Lord, give us wisdom and and help us to uh, make the decision that is in that is faithful to your word, not that is going to be most pleasing to us. Well, he's going to read the book uh, by the Olympian Eric Little, who refused to compete for his gold yes. medal on Sunday. So. I'm hoping that that would be... Well, that that was an excellent yeah. illustration. That when Eric, uh, what was his last name? Uh, Little. Little. When Eric, uh, who was a Cracker Jack runner in England some years back, well, quite a while ago, and he refused to run on Sunday, even though it... Uh, and he lost some opportunities to win the prize. But, right. But he had God's blessing on his life. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Yes. Um, I'm interested in uh, your thoughts on a passage regarding, regarding honoring your mother and your father. It's uh, Matthew 15, um, verse 5. Matthew 15, Verse 5. Let's look at that. But ye say, whatsoever, whosoever shall say to his father or mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Now this was a slick... Uh, means by which the Jewish, uh, some of the Jewish theologians could get around their responsibility to care for their aged parents. Uh, they, uh, they, they had plenty of money. We know that because they, in another place, God talks about them casting their gold and silver into the temple treasury. Uh, very doing it very publicly in order that they might receive the adulation of men. Oh, look how holy, holy, holy they are! Uh, this this was their life, and they uh, they argued with their parents. We're sorry, we can't care for you because we have pledged all of our funds, all of our uh, wherewithal to the service of God. We were sorry. We just can't help you. And so they were making a mockery of God's commandment to honor their father and their mother. They had a first responsibility to care for their parents, uh, and uh, and uh, then uh, then they could begin to to uh, care for the temple treasury. And thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, good evening, Brother Cameron. Yes. Yes, uh, last night we had a gentleman call you, and uh, he uh, asked you to read First uh, Peter 2.12. First Peter chapter 2, verse 12. Let's look at that. <coughs> First Peter chapter two verse twelve we read in having your conversation or your conduct honest among the Gentiles, that is among the nations, 
that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they behold glorify God in the day of visitation. Now, what is your question? Well, the accounts of uh, Achan in uh, the book of jo uh, Joshua. Uh, Joshua 7 1. Joshua 7 1. Joshua 7 1. We read, But the children of Israel committed a trespass in, an, in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Now, what is your question? Uh, uh, well, I was wondering if uh, Romans 7, I mean, Romans 14, 11, is more or less the same thing. It's about every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. Even though you are a non-believer at that time, uh, the honor will be given to God. Well, that's absolutely true. They will be given to God. But uh, in uh, in First Peter 2.12, what is the one good work? What is one of the main good works that God expects from the life of the child of God? And that is to obey, because good works is nothing different than obeying the commandments. And one of the foremost commandments for the child of God is that we're commanded to bring the gospel to the world. And, and as we bring the gospel to the world uh, faithfully, we are demonstrating our love for God, but it also means that it, it is the means through which God can save those that he plans to save. And so in the day of visitation, they will glorify God. Now, there, uh, when we, we do know that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess and will give glory to God on the, uh, on the last day, but, uh, but uh, that is only because they are under the judgment of God and recognize that Christ has a right to judge them and find them guilty and throw them into hell. But don't we see don't we see Achan as under the judgment because of his uh, violation? I, I'm sorry. Would you repeat that a little louder, please? Uh, uh, well, don't we look at Achan as, as being under the judgment of God? Well, yes. Because of and his uh, a transgression at that time. Yes, he was under. And remember that that uh, when Joshua confronted him, he said, "Give glory to God. Give glory to God." And tell me, where did you hide the accursed thing? And and uh, and yet uh, uh, Achan was about to be uh, be uh, punished by God, and that, and it's true that on the last day there will be those who give glory to God. But that is, it doesn't mean that they know any true believers. Remember, First Peter two verse twelve is talking about those who give glory to God because of the good works of those who are believers. But on the last day, uh, everyone who is not saved is going to be judged, and many of them have never known a true believer, but they're all going to give glory to God in the sense that Achan had to give glory to God. That is, he had to recognize that he is under the authority of God, and God has a right to bring terrible judgment against him. Uh, okay, well, I was just thinking that whether we uh, 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 do the, the visitation, which is uh, the, uh, at the judgment, our judgment, that we'll give uh, glory to God uh, one way or the other, we, we have no choice. Well, uh, everybody will who stands there. They have no choice because uh, because they they must recognize that Christ is a legitimate, the legitimate judge who has a right to judge them and cast them into hell. And thus, they, whether, whether they like it or not, they can be engaged in gnashing of teeth and, and uh, terrible anger, but yet in their soul they have to give glory to God because uh, they're acknowledging that Christ has the right to judge them. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Hello. Uh, good evening, Mr. Campy. Yes. My, 
My name is Lily, and I have a question to ask. Something happened um, to me that I found to be unusual, and I thought maybe you could answer this question for me. I opened the Bible up three times, and each time I did it, I opened it up to the same verse, which was Ezekiel twenty five seventeen. And to me, I thought that was pretty strange to to do that. And then I didn't really understand what the verse was about. So if maybe you could shed some light on on this for me. Well, the the fact that you open it up to, at the same point simply means that uh, uh, that Bible that you were holding uh, more easily opens up at that page than some other page. It doesn't mean now you, know, you don't have to become superstitious about this and say, oh my, then, then uh, this verse is particularly significant. As a matter of fact, it's only one verse on, on, uh, amongst a whole lot of verses because when you op opened your Bible to Ezekiel 25, it, uh, there are many verses that show up. But, but uh, uh, the fact is, anywhere we open a Bible and we begin to read it, and this is what you did, and this, was a, this is a wonderful thing that you did, because this is what we ought to do. You opened your Bible and you read all of the verses of chapter 25 and 26, or the ones that were on your open Bible, and you came across this verse, and it struck you uh, very sharply. And I will execute great vengeance upon them that with furious rebukes, and they shall know that I am the Lord, when I shall lay my vengeance upon them. And this is a verse that is describing the fact that God is the judge of all the earth. He is talking about, uh, uh, and, and as a matter of fact, uh, uh, the context shows that his judgment is on the churches and congregations. If you go back to verse 14, he says, And I will lay my vengeance upon Edom by the hand of my people Israel, and they shall do an Edom according to mine anger and according to my fury. And then he goes on, and uh, he says his judgment is on the Philistines. And, and so uh, God has indicated the Edom is a figure of, uh, is, a, is pointing to the churches and congregations that, that uh, are still existing at the time that Christ comes. And, and the Philistines include them as well as the world. And so God is simply saying that Judgment Day is coming. This, this verse is emphasizing something that is repeated again and again and again and again. That we don't play games with God. That finally He is going to come as the judge. And it's counterbalanced by the fact that God says, But... I have a wonderful salvation plan in which I will do this and I will do that to save people. And so we read the whole Bible so we can search out both truths. We want to know more and more about that salvation. We want to know more and more about the wrath of God because that's, that's something that that's, uh, uh, is focused on the human race. It's not the wrath of God against against uh, dogs and cats and uh, worms and rattlesnakes it's uh, the wrath of God on people okay well I thank you for taking the time to answer that question for me thank you for calling and sharing and shall we and take this as a cue keep reading keep reading turn the pages read some more and just keep reading and and you're going to have a lot of questions I wonder what God means by this I wonder what God means by that. Keep reading, praying, Oh Lord, Oh Lord, give me a little understanding of this. And, and, and uh, Oh Lord, above all, help me to be obedient to what I do understand. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we go to our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Uh, hello, Brother Campy? Yes. Hi, Brother Campy. Uh, I'm, I'm calling uh, to ask a question in reference to a friend of Bob. Yes. I'm trying to offer counseling to him. 
Um, he just finds himself in a situation where he has been married to the same woman for the past 12 years. During a period of time, she has... Um, I'm sorry, will you speak uh, very slowly and very... Uh, 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 speak right into your phone, please. I'm sorry, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, I found myself giving counseling to a Christian friend. Yes, I know. You want her speaking on You're asking a question on his behalf. Now, what is the situation? Um, the situation is that he has, uh, his wife has had uh, relations outside of marriage on three separate occasions um, during the past 12 years. Now, he has, um, he is now separated from her by living some, in, an, in an apartment. Um, he has tried to reconcile a marriage on several occasions. And my question to you, uh, given the allowances in, in Matthew 5 and 19 by Jesus, uh, specifically in this regard, what is the correct position you should be taken here? Well, the, in Matthew 5, uh, uh, as Christ is speaking, there was a situation where if a man found his wife in fornication, he could write a bill of divorcement. In Matthew 19, God rescinded that command, uh, and uh, and uh, we know that, that we've read that under we've understood that correctly because in First Corinthians 7, God says that a wife is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. That's First Corinthians 7 verse 39, or it's in Romans 7. In both places, in, in it's in Romans 7, verse uh, 3 or 4. Now, uh, the, this is what he must do if he's going to follow the Bible. The question is, uh, Peter came to Jesus in, in Matthew 18, verse 21. Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? And then let's paraphrase this. How oft shall I forgive my wife? Until seven times? All three times now I've already forgiven her. Now this is the fourth time. Now what? Jesus said unto him, verse 22, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. In other words, there's no end of our forgiveness. That marriage is a marriage, and the husband... One of the things he wants to do is read Ephesians 5 again. Is he loving his wife as Christ loved the church? Is he really uh, 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 trying to uh, think about her a lot more than about himself? Uh, trying to be the best husband possible. That's the beginning point. And at the same time, uh, am I ready to forgive my wife because... Uh, uh, I know that uh, when she does these things, it's evidence she's in trouble with God, and uh, and oh, and should I be, and I should be praying, oh Lord, have mercy on her. But now we've come to the end of our time, so I have to say good night. Uh, the uh, isn't it marvelous that we can talk so freely together about the Word of God, about the Bible, the very Word of God. This is what. God is saying, don't ever, ever lose your uh, understanding of how important the Bible is. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you. Good night.